Good day and welcome to this DECA webinar about ultra wideband technology. Ultra wideband, a new radio technology, opening up a lot of new applications as well. And my name is Vincent Roos, and together with my colleague Juan Carlos Mora, we will tell you more this afternoon about ultra wideband technology and the testing of the technology in terms of testing certification. So, what actually is ultra wideband? And as my colleague Juan Carlos explained it to me, it's not 5G, it's not fast, and it does not have a long range. So, okay, if that's not the case, what are the advantages then of this? And he said, well, it's much more secure, and especially the identification of objects moving around. And you can see it as like a kind of a continuous scanning radar that actually locks onto an object and can determine where the object is in the area. And that offers a lot of different possibilities of this new technology. So having said that, let me hand over to Juan Carlos Mora, Growth Management Director for the Service Division Product Testing and also responsible for the Business Line Connectivity. And uh, Juan Carlos will tell us more about ultra-wideband technology, um, the requirements and especially also on the testing and certification for ultra-wideband. Juan Carlos, over to you. Thank you, Vincent, for the introduction. Uh, you have been really talking very well about the ultra-wideband technology. And you have given a very good overview, I could say. So let me go inside what we are going to plan to, to present today. It's about the ultra wideband technology. So basically, we will explain how is the or what is the ultra wideband technology, what are the physical options, what are the technical standards uh, that has been progressing with that technology, uh, what is the technology compatibility or, or comparison with other technologies, how does ultra wideband work uh, in terms of precision and the main parameters we are we are doing. Some of the use cases of why this is good and for what. Um, some then, then later on we will talk about the different devices, some examples so that people can get on the job or can see really the real products are coming up. Um, some of the industry associations that are building standards and are trying to promote the technology itself. Uh, the regulatory, which is a mass requirement, and what are the services that take place of things. So what is really uh, Ultra wideband. So, as it, it the name says, it's a short range wire communication protocol that operates through impulse radio waves. An impulse at the end in the in the frequency domain becomes a wide band uh, uh, technology, wireless technology. So, you can see here on the right side different technologies like GPS or Wi Fi or Zigbee, Bluetooth that operating in the so called narrow band. So, and you can see the green one. It's operating in a very wide band of frequency. So, and very important here to, to check is that the, the technology itself is uh, spread it around the bands. So, from you can see here, even from 3.1 gigahertz to 10.6 gigahertz. So, it's a it's a very wide spectrum, and also it can really be working in the one gigahertz band. But let's focus on the 3.1, which is the the level, the power, the spectral density is very low. So it's not bothering other technologies and it's not bothered by other technologies. And at the same time, the information you can put inside this uh, signal is quite big, so quite important. Uh, let's let's talk about some of the parameters, like the operating, it's operating between, mainly operating between this uh, 3.1 to 10.6 gigahertz frequency band. Uh, it can have a bandwidth and start with a bandwidth of minimum uh, 500 megahertz. So normally uh, technologies like Bluetooth or, or Wi-Fi has one megahertz or up to 10 megahertz. So for instance, in 5G, we have up to 20 megahertz, but with, with Travivan, we go 10 times bigger uh, bandwidth. That allows us to, to probably share more information here. And the pulse, it's based on, it uses impulse radio with short pulses of two nanoseconds. So it's a stay in the air too short. That means in the spectrum, it remains long. But at the end, you are using not much the spectrum because you are just sending pulses, which is very robust to really uh, um, interference. And it has a very low spectral density, so it doesn't bother other technologies around. So that is really good. It's very close to the noise level. So uh, identify the technology itself is easy because it's been above the, the noise level, but it's not above other signals, as you can see here in the, in the graph. And it has also a very low power consumption because two nanoseconds transmitting is a very low power needed to do that. And very decent data rates. Uh, it's up to one megabit per second, uh, below 27 megabits per second. So not bad things to communicate 
uh, very important files, no, very important information. So I would say that the Trawalban is a continuously scanning radar, so that can precisely lock onto an object, discover its location, and moreover communicate with it. That's new, you know, compared to, for instance, GPS, right? What makes interesting for many applications, so uh, all these parameters make very interesting for hands-free access control, location-based services, and device-to-device -device services. We have two flavors of the technology uh, today. So the evolution has been that we started with several standards, we'll mention later on. But today, the, the, the main focus is on the 2.15.4 set standard, and we have the low rate pulse, LRP, okay? Repetition frequency, that means a minimum number of pulses repeated. So we have only a few pulses repeated. And then we have the other profile, what we call in the physical layer, called the high rate pulse, repetition frequency. So multiple pulses or so more pulses, up to you can see 100,000, sorry, 1,000 pulses per one millisecond. And in the case of the LRP is 100 pulses per one millisecond. So it's a huge difference. So based on these two different profiles or physical layers, the, the applications can be camping or can be used this, these two layers for different flavors or for different, um, yeah, as I said, applications. You can see a comparison between them. For instance, you have a low uh, current consumption when you have less pulses, and you have a, a very high consumption when you have multiple pulses. That's true. But uh, you know that you have some other things like the cost of ownership is low, the distance measurement latency is also faster for the low rate pulse uh, repetition frequency. So these are parameters. And you can compare with, for instance, with the Bluetooth low energy technology. So there are some advantages here. Of course, it's not replacing Bluetooth, but it's, it's good to, to really notice them. So let's go to the next one uh, about the standard that they're not using. As I say, it's based on mainly two standards today in the 802.15.6 and 802.15.4 uh, uh, with this low, rata, the low rate wireless personal area network. So that's the latest one that we are doing, developing, uh, or, or the technology is being developed. The ultra wideband evolved from OFTM uh, band uh, communication to an impulse radio. So we come from, as you can see in the graph here, we come from a very uh, frequency modulation technology, OFTM, okay, occupying a kind of a time, high tight domain behavior. So from just one pulse in the lower part of the graph, you can see the pulses are occupying only small time, all, all the space of time. And, and you can see on the other side of the frequency domain, the, the of FDM technologies at existing, for instance, Bluetooth technologies is occupying, for instance, 2.4 gigahertz, one very short pulse into the into the frequency domain, and the ultra wideband is occupying all these frequency bands, a very wide ultra wideband frequency. Uh, Key parameters today for us are, for instance, the output power. It's you can see it's 20, 74 nanowatts per megahertz. It's the lowest probably you, we can have today. You can have uh, up to 15 channels that enable you to really deal with the security and of course uh, robustness of the of the channels with the different applications you can have home or in your car. And you have a very decent range that can reach uh, your other party for communication, 200 meters. The accuracy, it's theoretical 10 centimeter, but we have been reaching already with this, some of the designs and the products we have seen in the market with uh, two centimeters. So it's quite, quite precise in terms of location. And the unit price is starting to get very competitive, 10 to $12. Uh, what is the evolution of the standard? So it was starting in 2002 with 802.15.3, but you know, going through the years and uh, with different physical profiles and uh, moving to different use cases. The technology has been evolving to 102.15.4 when we embedded uh, higher rates, data rates. Uh, uh, we have uh, different modulation schemes. We came in some more for data and ranging. We have in 2012, uh, the 4F, when we have um, a new modulation scheme, PPM and OOK. So we have the, also the, the real low rate pulsing ultra wide and physical layer, and then we move to 15.6 and the 15, for, sorry, 15.4 set technology, the latest development that are now being established here 
for the fine ranging security and low power consumption use cases. And that's what we focus in our uh, future uh, developments of the technology. So these two, two last uh, standards, and especially the last one. So uh, what is ultraviolet compared to other technologies? Uh, because it's wide band or it's a wide frequency range and inversely related is narrow pulse width. So small pulse in the time domain and a wide pulse in the frequency domain. The capabilities and characteristics are that it's not susceptible to interference and the effects of the, of the multipath that is happening in the other narrowband technologies. Ultraviolet can provide very accurate uh, um, positioning, and of course, they can accurate, they can be better than other technologies in, in the sorry uh, in the ranging, of course, accurate location and ranging. Ultraviolet can provide a secure, uh, I mean, communication channel with the other party because at the end, uh, what we are transmitting is information inside the pulse that is very uh, is uh, codified and is coded and is really transmitting. Quickly, so it's difficult to catch it up by the hackers. So as you can see from from the different um, technologies comparison, uh, compared to, for instance, Wi-Fi, the power consumption is low. Um, the range is up to 200 meters compared to Wi-Fi is 100 meters. So you can have the same kind of range. But here is coming the the advantages really when it's the accuracy is two centimeters up to 10 centimeters location, while the Wi-Fi is a few meters, and in Bluetooth, you have uh, maximum you can get is one meter. So you cannot do it before below that. Uh, the cost is really low compared even to a Wi Fi. Uh, the frequency band is different, the bandwidth we already mentioned. So, how does the ultra wideband work? Okay, uh, it's, it's really simple, but it's new here in the in technology. So basically it's working as we said as a radar. So once a device is equipped with an ultra relevant radio such as a smartphone, a smartphone it's uh, it could be you your your own phone that you are approaching for instance to to a car with a sensor ultra wideband. Let's say that uh, the initiator is your car here on, on this graph on this uh, and the responder it's your smartphone that has inside the car key. So, so once you initiate it, or the car initiating that the searching of your device and, and you detect it, the responder will self another pulse, or we send a pulse to responder, will upload it into the system, and then we send another pulse with information related to the, of course, to the uh, security in order to enable that the door can be open. So this is all measure the time of receiving each pulse is what we call the, the time of flight. So it's a measurement between the these two, and with this time of flight, we can we can uh, we can find out the distance between these two devices, and it's very useful, for instance, in indoor navigation services. But you need to still have a beacon, you know, or, uh, or to know the relative location of the of the object. So uh, it's something or, or the car, for instance. You need to have like a, a beacon in the place indoor that is telling you exactly where is the car related to this. To this beacon, to this uh, post. Uh, the real time accuracy of ultra wideband measurement is to know the precise the precise location of a device. So the degree of sensitivity is very, very good. And it's also very innovative here. You you could know or the device could know whether you are moving toward or away, right? From a given object. That's new. Uh, for example, uh, ultra wideband enable system um, can sense if you are moving towards or to a locked door or I can know if you are really in the inside or outside the doorway, which is very new. And then they can that in mind whether you need to double lock the door or just leave it, you know, leaving open because you probably go to, to the garden or just open the door for something simple. You can really program the device for that. Anyway, let me go to the next um, main parameters that we mentioned before. One is the time of flight. With the with the time calculating with the pulse sent to a post to your to your counterparty and back to the device, you could really know uh, the distance and with the angle of arrival, which is called AOA, and uh, you can know which position the object it is. So with the position and the distance, so with the the angle and the distance, you know exactly the 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 position of that object. So it's new. And it's really impressive how it works. Let's say, let's see how 
what will be the use cases? We mentioned before there will be a hands-free access control, one of the use cases where multiple applications can be working at. Basically, uh, you can apply across the door, uh, the doors without putting your hands in the pocket. The door can really secure and secure safely. Okay. Uh, it, it tracks, uh, for instance, the, 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 the solutions tracks uh, if you are approaching, verifies your security, your credential, and lets you pass without having to stop and tap like before. No? In other technologies, you need to tap with the phone or with the car. In that case, uh, in this case, you don't need to do that. For instance, going to a car to the to the trunk, you can open the trunk and no need to really tap the phone or, or move even the, the finger or the, the leg, you know, which is now one of the solutions today in the market. So it's really for, for, for me or for, for the technology, it's a hands-free access. Um, it's complete freedom of movement without compromising security because the identification process happened in one instant. Remember, we are sending pulses of one nanosecond. So in one nanosecond, you can send all your credentials to the system and it will just be in the air one nanosecond. So, oh, sorry, two nanoseconds. It's really, it's really a short time that people can hack, you know, that you need to be there at least. And of course, all is uh, codified and it's all really uh, secure with the information you can map into this, uh, into this pulse. Anyway, uh, the web technology knows that you're approaching, leaving, understand what side of the door you are, so the lock and, and lock functions happen at the real time, at the right times, so, in response to your to your movement and positioning. Working in security in combination with other technologies is possible. So, working, for instance, as a Bluetooth with Bluetooth low, low energy, if, for instance, to initiate uh, a, a search, uh, it also can work with uh, near field communication for setting up if you want, but it's self. Setting up, I mean, set really um, set up the technology by itself. I could be really implemented in mobile phones, patch, and other wearables that um, can even lock and lock when the, the device is turned off. So, or in a sleep mode. That's very really important. Okay, it's uh, other use case will be the location based services. We mentioned about the precision and accuracy of this two to 10 centimeter. So, uh, no big thing to say here, the, the, the technology brings BPS style position functionality even with a much higher degree of the more accurate GPS today and includes, including the indoor environments like a garage or like a department stores. So, uh, that's very true. It's offering highly precise positioning even in crowded multipath signal environments with no, it's very robust to the noise, it's very robust to the interference and can pass through walls given the high frequency ranges using machinery and other obstacles. So it's a very key advantage of the technology. It's make easy navigate in larger space like airports and shopping malls and make it easy to find your car in a multi uh, stationary or multi-story parking garage. High precision positioning also enables targeted digital marketing, you know, very, very target to, to certain persons and food traffic data. That's very important here. Device to device services probably can simplify that you can really have a song or a movie or your recent file or your recent um, you know, message to your friends. And just I need to appoint another device, another people, another person you have in the room and it will sign it automatically. That could be one of the applications. So people will enjoy of this high precision uh, sending uh, big data rates through through that one. So. So I, I think uh, let's go to other use cases of the ultra wideband. So the world is open up with these new use cases for smart cities and mobility, uh, for smart building and industrial. We have here also a smart retail. We also can have application for medical when you can measure even your your respiration. Uh, it's used today for apnea treatment. So because it can measure two centimeters, even below that for some of the applications I've seen already in the market, that you can, your respiration, your moves while you are sleeping are controlled and can identify even if, if it's you, the, if the passion is there or not. It's something good, no? Um, let's see how, what are the devices we can see in the market. We have high precision indoor tracking devices that can really track or, or locate your objects of the most value. Also for a company that want to uh, track their, their assets. It's, uh, it's very important. The ultra one music sharing players, you can with a move of, of a finger, appointing to your friend, you can share the same song uh, in different devices. Uh, 
one of the key applications I like is like digital car key that you can have in a physical car key that, for instance, uh, a vendor can provide to you for your own car, or you can install the car key into your um, smartphone that you always wear with you, so you don't need to carry out any more those those maybe heavy car keys. Or, or <clears throat> and, and the good thing is you could share the car key. So imagine for retail cars or for rental cars, that you can go to an airport today, uh, tomorrow, and uh, without going to the counter, you can easily uh, lock, unlock your car and drive it away to your hotel. So there are other things like a smartphone speakers, tools, um, tiles here, and uh, automotive sensor for, for other uh, car applications. This is a world to discover. Okay, uh, let's talk about the different industry associations. They are trying to build the standard for, for uh, ultra wideband. And today, I think the first one was starting the was the, the ultra wideband alliance. But the main job was to create um, uh, the standard within the, the IEEE on the 802.15 for seed and really try to create a federal uh, regulatory and spectrum uh, management uh, landscape to maximize the, the use of the ultra wide map. Right? And it's also still working to secure new advantage rule sets uh, to span the use cases uh, in different countries. So it's making a very good uh, progress with the regulatory uh, um, association of the regulatory um, authorities into the different countries. The fire consortium is standardized too with the, also within, within the IEEE and provides also very regulatory and spectrum management landscape. Same thing, but at the same time it's also securing and do, um, developing a certification process within the, the ultra web and technology. And the last and not least is for the Cal Connectivity Consortium. That's the one maybe focus more in certification and they have different flavors like MicroLink, which is not related for, for instance, to ultra wideband, but it's related to the cards, the card data, and uh, basically the digital car key. So this is the one they are they are now moving into the um, one of the applications that I think is is going to be dis disruptive in the market. So uh, some of the use cases today they are looking into this um, ultra wideband is they unlock the vehicle, uh, start the engine, user identification. So there are a lot of um, use cases, I would say, within the digital car key that we will see, uh, we already can see in some of the, the manufacturers, but we will see soon also in the in the future. Regulatory requirements. So these are the requirements that basically a country or a region are requiring to enable the device to be commercialized and into that country. We, we try to collect in this presentation some of the most generic requirements in the, especially in the European Union, that is uh, basically a standard that is followed by multiple countries. We can have up to 50 to 60 countries in the world that are adopting the European uh, standards. That's why we mention them here. And so in, in, in principle, what is important is to, for certification is to know or to identify the use cases of this uh, application, okay? And the vertical, the vertical markets, uh, it will work. Uh, that's that's also important because based on that definition of the application and the vertical market, you need to apply to a different type of standard. The standards are all based in the RF 302.6, uh, sorry, 065, and then depends on this as a generic ultra web application or location tracking or a ground-based vehicle application or an onboard aircraft application. We have some others here. Uh, you need to go for that uh, area of the standard to test. For EMC, you have the famous 301.4A9. It's the version specific for ultra wideband is the slash 33, version 2.2. Actually, I took the liberty to, to write the latest one today. And also for safety, we, we related to the IT products uh, 62360A. Of course, if you embedded this into another application uh, for medical or for other, uh, or for vehicle, you need to go through the standardization process in that kind of uh, homologation or, or, or applications. Um, uh, we also have the specific assumption rate. If the power level is too low, of course, everybody knows, but you still have to go and do the maximum permissive special exposure calculation with that. So for US, uh, the main radio frequency standard, or US and Canada will follow a similar, the same standard. It's under today and the part 15 subpart F, uh, 15 dot. 519 is a specific one today, and the EMC is under the 15B that is 
related to the IT products. Um, STEM, in terms of the specific absorption rate, we still go through the maximum permissive procedure calculation will be required here. Anyway, we have also uh, the Japan law, some of the standards. Um, what are the data services here? I don't know if uh, we can mention. We have uh, in DECRA global market access. We support customers uh, uh, in terms of regulatory requirements, uh, FCC, CE, Japan, and some of the other countries, if you need approval there. And we have the industry association uh, on development. We are we are now optional. They are optional always, but we are now entering into this uh, into these associations. Uh, so in in order to access some of the global markets, uh, you for sure you need the the regulatory requirements. And in some cases, for some big buyers, you need to go through the the industry associations. The class uh, is offering that, that now. And with that, you can have the license to sell, of course, the access to, to this global market. So why DECRA? So basically, we have a good uh, number of experts in telecommunications, uh, very good uh, wireless connectivity and driving, connected driving service portfolio. We have a global network of accredited laboratories. Uh, in total, we have 15 global test laboratories. Uh, we are an active member in the industry consortium in ultra wave one for sure, and also in another for us, like for instance, 5G, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, or even um, those uh, low range power technologies. We also have a wide range of test tools and capabilities. Uh, we have a high speed in multi markets, uh, multiple market segments, uh, medical, uh, machinery, industrial, of course, vehicular or, or automotive, as we call it today. And customer, we offer customer services which have uh, more than 25 years experience in mobile testing, for instance. We have an outstanding testing capabilities and capacities globally. Uh, good uh, online project management tool that help uh, to track and monitor your projects. Um, we are continuously innovating um, and adding new services to our portfolio. Thank you uh, for taking care of safety, always. We have to be safe. Um, thank you for... Uh, then in the seminar. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Charlie, for uh, let's say your introduction in uh, in the technology and the service as well. I have a few questions uh, for you. Uh, one is, let's say you ended with uh, the fact that we have the regulatory uh, aspects and we have the um, uh, the cert industry certification as well. Uh, what what will be the key aspects to test ultra wide products? Yeah, there will be, as I said, there will be the radio frequency um, and especially the time of flight. We will be uh, one of the measurements that we are. Uh, we probably need to really monitor and test it. The the angle of arrival will be another one. Um, of course, sensitivity of those devices, transmitted power, this will be uh, key elements to be considered apart from the regulatory and apart, of course, of industry requirements that are focused on the technology itself also. But uh, yeah, and cyber security, okay? That's one of the things that you ask. I would say, yes. So actually it's a quite a full set and a full scope of, of services for that. You also mentioned uh, global market access. I think it's an important element you, you mentioned there as well. So not only as for, for European exports market, the ultra wide band technology products, but as well for uh, the Americas, uh, Japan, Taiwan, and, and different uh, areas of the world. Um, you also mentioned, uh, uh, you, you called it a complete freedom of movement and security. And I'm actually wondering, uh, you have studied the technology a bit, you are working in this field for quite some time. What, in your view, is the killer application, the killer application for ultra-wideband technology? I, I think uh, there will be a few killer applications, but one I feel is a very, very key size is the, the digital key. So to unlock your home, to unlock your car, that's one of the things um, for me becomes amazing that you uh, you don't need to worry anymore to carry out your keys and you can share that. So that's for me uh, uh, very important. Thanks, uh, thanks for that, uh, Juan Carlos. Uh, uh, indeed, new developments, uh, new technology, uh, interesting applications. So thank you very much for watching this webinar about the ultra wideband technology and giving an insight to that technology and also giving an insight in the possibilities uh, of testing that technology. Um, please keep an eye on the internet sites uh, of DECRA. We will uh, post regularly new webinars about the new technologies and about new services. Thank you very much. <laughs>